greetings everyone. It's time for the Bible study today. And looking at my calendar, today is the fifth day of August 2017. And twelfth um, day. Twelfth day of Av. The ninth of Av was this past Wednesday. The Jewish uh, community celebrated it on Tuesday, but the Karaites didn't celebrate it till Thursday. So we're right in the middle. And it was the ninth of Av was Wednesday this year. According to the uh, potential new moon calendar, it would have easily been visible if the skies had been clear in Jerusalem and Israel. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> today is the twelfth day of Av, and the Torah portion for today is Vatkanan, or Vatkanan. I need to brush up on my Hebrew, I guess. Veit Kanan. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, this is a very important part of the time of the year. And this is the first Sabbath of the, actually, uh, the Sabbath of Consolation. And this be actually begins with Isaiah chapter 40. In verse 1, a very important scripture of consolation for this time of year. And it begins with the words, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from Jehovah's hand double for all her sins. Nakmanu, Nakmanu. God says, comfort, comfort my people. In other words, this is the first Sabbath of encouragement and comforting after the horrendous repetition and re renewal and reviewal of the narrow straits from Tammuz 17 to Av 9, between the straits, the times of tremendous persecution upon God's people down through the centuries, culminating with the fall of the temple and its destruction, both in 586 B.C., in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, and in 70 A.D., in the days of Titus and Vespasian, generals of Rome. And we've discussed that before, that the 9th of Av is also the date when the spies returned from the land of Canaan, with their evil report and told the Israelite nation that it was a land that devoured its inhabitants and that the giants lived there and that they were in the giant side as grasshoppers as they were in their own sight. And they said, by no way can we conquer this land. We're doomed. We're doomed. And the people were scared to death after hearing that report from ten of the spies. And they said, why are we here, Moses? Why did you bring us here? We're going to die. And they were ready to stone Moses and Aaron and go back to Egypt. And God was so upset with them, he told them, 
that because of their lack of faith and not trusting in him after all the miracles they had seen, that they were doomed to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for every day that they had spied out the land. They would wander in the wilderness and die in the wilderness until that whole generation was dead and their children would be the ones to go in to the Holy Land and conquer the land of Canaan. Because they didn't have faith. They felt it was hopeless. They didn't give God a chance, you might say, to show his power and his love for them. They didn't give him a chance. They said, no, we can't do it. Blah, 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 whine, 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 cry, 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 boo, 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 hoo. And they just got into a fit, the tizzy, threw a tantrum. And God had to rebuke them severely and tell them because of their faithlessness and lack of faith and endurance and obedience and just lack of looking to him that they were going to die in the wilderness. They brought it on themselves. And because of this day has gone down in infamy as a time of horror, a time of disaster, well, it still is today. And the temple of God is still lying in ruins in Jerusalem, there is no temple today because the curse upon the children of Israel and Judah, the Jews and the Israelites is still in effect. They have not yet rebuilt the temple of God. So the curse remains. Most of the Jews is still scattered around the world. And most of the Israelites of the northern ten, ten tribes are still scattered. But an ancient Jewish prophecy or tradition says that when there's more Jews living in Israel than there are in the rest of the world, in the times of the Messiah, will return and the, in the time for the rebuilding of the temple will occur and we are now on the verge of that time because today there's more Jews in Israel as I understand the counting than there is in the rest of the world we passed the tipping point so now the time has come for the birth pains of the Messiah, the times of the Messiah to re return, and the time for the temple to be rebuilt. The world today, however, is in a very precarious state. As you can see from the news, every week, America itself is on the ropes, on tenderhooks. The nation is divided, it has never been in history. President Donald Trump is being attacked from every side, from the do-nothing Republicans to the acrimonious Democrats. Some are threatening impeachment, and the radical left is threatening assassination. And as America tiptoes toward the apocalypse, the whole world hangs breathless, wondering what's going to happen next. As I speak today, billions of lives are at stake. 
not only because of America and the threat from North Korea, which now the pundits and the military generals are telling us North Korea not only has intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of hitting all of America and Chicago and probably New York, and Seattle and San Francisco and Houston, but they're also developing the hydrogen bomb. They don't just have nuclear bombs now, but very likely they'll have a hydrogen bomb in six months to a year. In that little country run by a madman dictator is threatening to explode the whole world into a nuclear exchange. But that's not all. China today is threatening India with another war with billions of lives at stake. China and India themselves, between them, have over two billion inhabitants. It says an article on my desk, it could be argued that there's never been a time in history where so many Americans thought that we were on the brink of another major world war. If you look at the news about Syria, North Korea, or Russia, you'd find that 76 percent of Americans are worried that another war is going to break out in, in the next four years. Eighty percent are afraid we may be embroiled in a war with, with North Korea in the near future. But, meanwhile, simmering in another part of the world, China and India have been engaged in a border dispute for decades. That dispute has flared up once again. And China is now threatening India with war. Beijing is threatening to amass troops and armaments at the border of India in anticipation of what could turn out to be an all-out war for dominion in Asia. This isn't the first time their armies have been poised for war between India and China. In 1962 their armies clashed leading to the defeat of the Indian Army and thousands of casualties on both sides. It appears today that China is more than willing to renew the conflict. If war broke out between China and India, today it would be far different from the war in 1962. This time around, both nations now possess hundreds of nuclear weapons. And, right between them, lies Pakistan, another nuclear-armed nation, which has fought with India many times with border disputes over Kashmir. Pakistan could also be swept into the vortex. So billions of lives are at stake every time these nations get around to rattling the saber, hurling threats at each other. In fact, if you stop and think about it, 
The whole world today, planet Earth, is a simmering powder keg with the lit fuse. And all we don't know is how long is the fuse before the powder keg explodes. Another article in my, on my desk, Has America Passed the Point of No Return? is the title. Is it too late for America? Are the nation's best days behind us? Can our sickly nation be saved? Dinesh D'Souza, who's put out some very powerful movies on Hillary Clinton, sent out an email recently entitled, On the Brink of Losing America Forever. And he says that it feels that we are very close. But have we passed the point of no return? We can all look at our nation and see a mountain of sins and crimes that are rampant in our country including killing 55 million babies in the womb through abortion since Roe v. Wade. America could be indicted on many fronts, but has God written us off, or do we still have a chance of repentance and salvation? In 1989, D'Souza wrote a book asking, Is God through with America? Is he ready to spew us out of his mouth? Or is it too late for revival? That was 1989. Now, he says, almost 30 years later, these questions are much more urgent. His newest book is entitled, Saving a Sick America, a Prescription for Moral and Cultural Reformation. It's due out this coming September. To use a physical analogy, D'Souza says, America has a cancer. And without radical treatment, that cancer will soon be terminal. But with major medical intervention and a total change of lifestyle, the prognosis is promising. The question is, how are we going to respond? What are we going to do? D'Souza says we need a sense of desperation, a sense of urgency. Our fate hangs in the balance. We need another great awakening, a revival, a massive spiritual revival, crying out to God, declaring a national day of fasting and prayer, like the Ninevites did in ancient Nineveh in the days of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. We need another Great Awakening. D'Souza says he would tell the story of an all-American dad who fell asleep while watching Leave it to Beaver on television back in 1961. And this American dad wakes up in the year 2017, this year, and he sees the changes in the nation that are stark and shocking and deeply disturbing. How do we get, he thought, thinks in his mind, from 1961 and the Ozzie and Harriet days and Leave it to Beaver 
to 2017, where everything goes and wildness is rampant and murder and mayhem is everywhere. Well, Denise D'Souza says, I truly believe America can still be saved, but only if we do not minimize the urgency of the hour. No doubt God does love his people. But if we're going to be saved, we have to do what the Apostle Peter said in the book of Acts, chapter 3. He said to the Jews, hearing him preaching at the temple, he said, save yourselves from this evil generation. Save yourselves. And that's what America has to do. You have to save yourself. How do you do that? By turning to God, by turning to His Word, by confessing your sins, by crying out to the Lord, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The prophet Joel said, Joel chapter 3, we need to call on the Lord Jehovah our God. The President Trump wants to make America great again. And he's got the right idea. His motive is to save America. To achieve greatness like we've never seen before. But we can't do it unless we repent and turn around and begin to build America on the foundation of the laws of God and our founding fathers. We have to build by being constructive, building education, building our highways and infrastructure, building our universities, building our military, building our homes, building our churches, But the nation today is not cooperating with President Trump. Half the people, half the people love him and want to see him succeed. But half the people hate him and want to see him destroyed and run out of office or run out of town on a rail. On July 24, an evangelical pastor from South Africa says that he met with a senior Republican congressman who told him of a plot to remove President Trump suddenly from office. Rodney Howard Brown says he spent three hours from 9.30 in the evening until 12.30 a.m. in the morning with the senior ranking member of Congress. He said he told him there was a plot on Capitol Hill to take out the president. The pastor said, you mean by impeachment or by indictment? The congressman said, no, to take him out. He will be suddenly removed from office. Howard Brown said, you can read between the lines. The congressman had been in office since 1996 
and went on to say, there's nothing we can do to stop it. According to Pastor Howard Brown, the deep state, the intelligence communities, the Congress, Democrats, Republicans, those who are considered part of the, quote, deep state, unquote, have started a war against Trump because he's been more amenable to the evangelical community than any previous president, going back as far as Ronald Reagan. The South African pastor called for people around the world to pray around the clock for the protection of the president. I think that's very serious and we ought to do as he says. I, I pray for President Trump every day that God will use him and bless him and protect him and his family. And I believe that Almighty God is going to use President Trump mightily but we have yet to see in what manner God will use him. But he's already using him powerfully. Have you noticed the stock market has risen to another high, over 22,000 points on the Dow Jones. The unemployment rate in America is now the lowest it's been in 16 years. Because of Donald Trump, the economy has been burgeoning. Why is that? Because I said to my wife, Cappy, this morning, this because the people are energized. They have faith. They have confidence. Confidence in Trump. Confidence in the dollar confidence in the economy and so therefore they are spending money and that's keeping the economy growing and booming under eight years of Obama we never had growth over the yearly growth in the economy of over 1.6 percent it's always around one percent now, after the first six months of Donald Trump's presidency, our economy is growing 2.6% and headed toward 3% annual growth. It's a turnaround. You could say happy days are coming. Happy days are here again. If they continue. If. If. If people don't lose faith, or if the country isn't sabotaged. But guess what? At the same time, the true colors of Pope Francis are beginning to come out, and they are black and white, and smell like a skunk. Pope Francis and his associates are now comparing U.S. Christians, American Christians, evangelicals, to terrorists. That's right, the head, the Jesuit head of the Roman Catholic Church and his aides, close aides, to Pope Francis and drawn comparisons between Islamic terrorists and American evangelical Christians.
They teamed up to write a blistering attack on U.S. Christians, even including U.S. Catholics, who embrace the conservative values of evangelicals. Because the Pope is definitely not conservative. He is a radical, progressive, communist Jesuit. But according to the Pope and his cardinals and associates, evangelicals are characterized by fear. Fear is the basis of fundamentalism. And so they reject fundamentalism. They reject the Bible and Bible values. Another source of division. So this past week, the ninth of Av came and went. The end of the th three weeks of the narrow straits, the three weeks between the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av. We got through it okay this year. A period of suffering for the Jewish people. But there are lessons to be learned from the 9th of Av period of most intense suffering in the Jews throughout history. We've gone through that before, but it is the time when the first temple was destroyed in 586 BC. The second temple was destroyed in the ninth of Av, and some two million Jews died in 70 AD. The Bar Kokhba Rebellion occurred and was crushed by the Roman Emperor Hadrian in 135 AD, with over a half a million Jews slaughtered. Then the temple itself and its surroundings were plowed under by the Roman General Turnus Rufus in 135 AD. And Jerusalem was rebuilt as a pagan city called Aelia Capitolina. And it was forbidden access to the Jews. Down through history, in 1492, the Spanish Inquisition broke out against the Jews. And they were expelled from Spain. And those who remained were forced to convert to Catholicism or be tortured and be put to death. Interestingly, in 1914, World War I broke out on Tish B'Av in 1914 when Germany declared war on Russia. Then in 1942, the mass deportation of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto began on the 9th of Av. They were deported from Warsaw to the gas ovens of Treblinka, the extermination camps of the Nazis. So the ninth of Av is a day of mourning and destruction and horror in Jewish memory. And on that day, the Jewish synagogues all recite the Book of Lamentations. 
written by the prophet Jeremiah. And they sing it as a song in the synagogues, a song of lamentations. The song or the Megillah begins, Alas, she sits in solitude. Like a widow, she weeps bitterly in the night, and her tear is on her cheek. She has no comforter from all her lovers, her paramours. Her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. So the Jews today on the 9th of Av cry over the destruction of the people, Jerusalem and the temple. They cry over the loss of unity and peace throughout the entire world. They cry because of the disappearance of the divine presence on earth when the temple was destroyed and the disappearance of holiness from our lives from the contact with God. It's as if something very precious has been taken away from the world, taken away from us forever or until the temple is re restored. In the meantime, it's as if we are meant to cry, to be shocked and angry, and to break down in tears. On the ninth of Av every year, therefore, the Jewish people mourn the destruction of the temple. It's not just the building that they're crying over. They're crying over the incredible closeness with God that we had when he dwelt in our midst in the temple. We had that feeling that he was truly with us. And now we no longer have that feeling. It's evaporated into thin air because the temple is no longer there. Something very precious has been taken away from us. Therefore, we are meant to cry. We are supposed to mourn the destruction of the temple, to cry over it because it's been uprooted from the face of the earth. We want to restore our contact with God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the temple were rebuilt and we'd had that access once again, that God dwelt among us once again, in a literal way. An article in Aish.com this year talks about Tishbaav and waking up to a world without God's presence. The man compares this to how he felt when his father died. His father was a very wonderful man and a rabbi. And when he died, he says it took him a year to learn to navigate the new world and its emotional byways. The world without my father, he found, was empty and void and tough. Likewise, he says, Tishbuav is more like a death than a destruction, because on that day the world changed irrevocably and dramatically. We today were born into a world 
without the divine presence and therefore have never experienced the spiritual luminosity that was here when the temple existed and God abode in the temple. We now live in a dimmer, coarser carnal-minded world where the physical seems all-important, where the spiritual reality seems like a, a ghost, a vague phantasm. We live in a nightmare today without the presence of God, evil crescendos and suffering explodes everywhere. According to the Jews, when the temple stood, ten miracles were constant for everybody to see. Among them was that no matter from how, how the wind blew, the smoke from the altar in the temple always went straight up. Another miracle was that no matter how many people and crowds packed onto the Temple Mount and took part in the temple services where everyone had to prostrate themselves on the temple floor. There was always sufficient room. It expanded to accommodate the numbers of people who visited the temple. They could all see these miracles. Likewise, on the Passover, when they brought the lambs to be butchered for the Passover sacrifice to the temple, a miracle occurred, and everyone was accommodated. And Jerusalem used to have two to three million more people come to the Passover to the temple and it held everyone miraculously says the author these deviations from the normal laws of physics occurred simply by entering the temple precincts that should not be so remarkable. God is the one that brought his people through the Red Sea. God is the one who took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 people by the hands of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And on another occasion, 4,000 people with just a few loaves and a couple of fish. God can do these things. He says when the first temple stood, some three million Jews were privy to the highest spiritual level possible. In ancient Israel, schools of prophets abounded. So rampant was the divine revelation that all Jews were either prophets or the children of prophets, according to the Talmud, during the time of the first temple. Well, we are entering a time today, I think, in the end of this age, where divine revelation is once again being granted mankind. We are entering a period where the temple is going to be rebuilt, and God is once again going to reveal himself and his Shekinah presence to the nations of the world.
like he hasn't done in 2,000 years or even since Mount Sinai. So the writer says, Tishbaav, when the temple was destroyed, the dogged illusion of divine absence settled over the people and over the world like a perpetual fog, a world where there was no divine revelation, but the divine became hidden. divine absence. So today the world gropes for proofs of God's existence, like fish debating the existence of water. Today the world is relegated to believing what once we simply knew as a fact. Today the world has embraced evolution thinking there is no God. We, str we struggle today through prayer and meditation to experience a momentary linking with the Divine Presence. Where once upon a time, we simply basked in it. We are like amnesiacs. Like, like Rip Van Winkle, awakening from a 20 years snooze. But Tish B'Av, although it pictures a time of catastrophe and calamity, it's reversible. Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook declared, the temple was destroyed because of causeless hatred amongst the Jewish people. It can be rebuilt only by causeless love. Key to rebuilding is to reunify, come back together with love for one another. What is causeless love? Causeless love means loving every single Jew or Christian or American or the whole world as your brothers and your sisters without cause. Not because they deserve it, but because you love them like God loves us. What is that famous scripture, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Yeah, I read this this morning and it inspired me to realize, you know, God wants us, you and me, to love each other and to love our neighbor and love other Christians and Jews and Catholics and Muslims even, to love everyone because they are human beings made in God's image. They are all, we are all the children of God. Even if we don't know it, even if we deny it, still the facts are God created each and every one of us. And we should love our brothers and our sisters as we love ourselves, 
And if we achieve that love, then God will come back and dwell amongst us. And the temple will be rebuilt. In other words, no matter how much people differ from you and me and our political beliefs or our religious persuasion, we should love people at the other end of the spectrum, the other end of the ideological spectrum. We should love even abortion rights activists. We should love Zionists and anti-Zionists and post-Zionists. We should love Methodists and Baptists and Episcopalians. We should love people in the Worldwide Church of God, United Church of God, Philadelphia Church of God, and every Church of God. We need to seek to manifest causeless love and not get up on our high horse with proud and self-righteous hatred toward others. Causeless love may seem like an impossible achievement, but it is possible. There is a spiritual law in Judaism called Mida Kaneged Mida, measure for measure. Measure for measure means that whatever humans do, God responds to them in kind, measure for measure. When we want God to go beyond the laws of nature, we must go beyond our own nature to tap into this spiritual law we should take on the mitzvah the doing good where we've never done good before We can save someone's life if we learn the principle of Mida Kenegan Mida, measure for measure. A woman had an argument, this woman who wrote this had an argument with her husband. She says, I walked away from him feeling hurt and rejected. I fled to my room, wanting only to distance myself from him. As I sat on the edge of my bed, I rehearsed to myself everything I had learned about life's essential choice. Choosing between estrangement and oneness Choosing between separation and being together. Choosing between unity and apartness. She says, I knew that the higher road would be to reconcile with my husband, or at least to be open to whatever conciliatory steps he took. But my whole nature wanted to withdraw. I sat there for some ten minutes, warring with myself. I knew exactly what I should do, but I was incapable of doing it. As a paraplegic would be trying to pole vault. Suddenly I was saying to myself out loud, I can't do it. You know, can't is a quitter that never could. 
I heard my own voice saying, can you do it for so-and-so? Can you do it to save a boy's life? Yes, came my resounding reply. To save Daniel's life, I can overcome my own nature. Daniel was a poor boy lying face down in a hospital. And she was the, had been visiting him. And he was then moving on bed, on the bed, lying prone, very, very sick. And as she watched him, she grabbed her daughter's hand and quickly exited from the hospital. But the scene of that boy lying face down haunted her. And she thought about this. The, can I do a little mitzvah myself and maybe save that boy's life? Just by doing good. So she said to herself, I can fight this urge to flee, to reject my husband and estrangement. I can overcome my own nature. So she battled her instinct to push her husband away and lovingly accepted his apology. It made her feel like a hero, hero or a heroine. She says, I knew that I couldn't do it, but for Daniel's life, I did it. She overcame her resentment, and guess what? They went back to the hospital, visited Daniel, and despite the fact he had had a dangerous infection, Daniel had a miraculous recovery. Measure for measure, God works miracles. But we have to initiate the miracle by initiating faith, by believing it's possible, not by deciding, well, I can't. Like the Israelites going into the Promised Land said, we can't do it. There are giants there. Horrors to Betsy. But we have to have the attitude that wrestling ourselves into submission and our attitudes of faithlessness and saying, I believe I can do it. I will do it. I will die trying to do it if I need to, but I'm going to do it. Reminds me of several years ago. I was building, moving two houses onto a lot in Pasadena. The two houses were on a lot owned by Caltech, and they were going to wipe those houses off and put in a parking lot so President George Herbert Walker Bush could speak to their student body at graduation. And they had to have parking. And they offered to sell those two houses to a builder and they would even pay for moving the houses. $20,000 in moving costs. Well, I put in my bid, because I owned a vacant lot, about a mile from Caltech. And they accepted my bid. And so we got ready to move the houses, but I had to get clearance from the city of Pasadena. Zoning department, building department, public works department, about 10 different departments, even the fire department. I finally jumped through all the hoops and jumped through all the hurdles, got everything ready to go, 
and we were ready to move the houses, except the Public Works Department held it up until finally they said okay. They approved it. But then that had to go to the City Council for their stamp of approval. And they only met once a month. And now we were up to the deadline. And within a couple days, Caltech was going to bulldoze the houses. And all of my work would have been in vain. And I, so I went up to the Public Works Department with my map and my building plans to the Public Works and spread it out on the table. And I looked them in the eye and I said, I began this project in faith and I will finish it in faith. And I said, now what can we do about this? What can we do to save the project? And they looked at it. They had sort of a cowed, quiet expression, but they all looked at it. They looked at my lot, and they said, well, what's this vacant lot next to your lot? And I said, that's a vacant lot owned by the city of Pasadena. The railroad used to run through there. Caltrans. And they said, well, can you move the houses onto that lot? And I said, well, sure. We could do that. It was right adjacent to my lot. And it was empty. And they said, well, if we, we can get approval from Mr. Nolan of the city of Pasadena, and then uh, you'd be free to move the houses. So the next day they contacted Mr. Nolan. They got back to me that, mor that at morning and said, you got the approval, you can move the houses. And I called up the moving company. They, they came that night at midnight and moved those two houses onto the lot. And the next day, the bulldozers were bulldozing down the rest of the buildings and preparing the parking lot for Caltech. Now that was, to me, a miracle in action. The hand of God. I believed we could do it. I said, I will finish this work in faith. I had no idea how we would do it. But God intervened, and we saved it, and then a few years ago we finished those houses, rented them out, and then in 2005 we sold them. The, stock, the building real estate market in Southern California was going bananas. Prices were going up almost probably daily. And for a property that I spent $60,000 to buy, and then moving two houses on, we wound up selling for over half a million dollars, counting the three little houses on the property for $120,000, and then moving these two houses on and selling them for $425,000. We wound up with half a million dollars between the two sales. And we could have lost everything. But that was God's doing. And as the scripture says, this is the day the Lord hath made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. And it's marvelous in our eyes what God can do. So the temple was destroyed. The first temple by was destroyed by the Babylonians because of idolatry, Sabbath breaking, 
and wrong relationships. And the second temple was destroyed because of causeless hatred amongst the people of Israel. The Jewish people hating one another and hating the Messianics, the Christians, and killing the Messiah who was sent to them. But the temple can be rebuilt through causeless love. We need to return to the laws of God and the laws of love. The laws of God are based on love. Punishment comes because of rebellion and wickedness. Punishment comes because of idolatry and Sabbath breaking and wrong relationships. But God wants us to learn to love one another. He wants us to learn that we, we can accomplish. We don't need to bask in failure or cry over our inability to, to succeed. We need to realize that it is God who created us and God gives us the ability to succeed and be winners. And He intends for us to win, to succeed. The Torah portion for this week is Vedkanan. Vedkanan teaches us to be grateful for what God has given us. It, te it teaches us to, when we get up in the morning, we should praise God and thank Him for the new day. And for the opportunities that He's given to us because we're alive. God has an individualized plan for you and for every human being, for your personal growth and spirituality, for your character development. Everything that happens to you is ultimately from God and is for your good. Sometimes it may be painful or difficult but that's what, if that's what your Heavenly Father has set before you, then it is the absolutely the best situation for you at this time. Therefore, we should have the attitude and recognize that fact with gratefulness and appreciation. The reality is that God is God. He is creator and he is good. He is perfect and he loves you. And he knows you personally. And he has a fabulous, magnificent love for you. So we need to, I think, do like the Rabbi Joseph Kramer does. He is famous for his reply to people who come up to him and ask him, well, how are you? How are you? And he always replies, it couldn't be better. Very positive, it couldn't be better. How are you today? We've come through Tishba Av. We're still alive. We've gone through the period period of mornings, 
and sadness and sorrow, meditating on the grief and the destruction of the temples of God and the house of God. But we're still alive and we're still able to live and breathe and worship God and serve God. So how are we? Well, maybe we should just say, I'm great. I feel great. Not just, I can't complain, but I feel wonderful, fabulous. Thank God. Thank God there is a God who cares about me and you. When you wake up, wake up in the morning, as it says in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, we should give thanks to God. And with the prophet say, Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3 Let's turn there. After all the suffering, discussed in the, the Book of Lamentations because of the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple. Chapter 3, beginning verse 19. It says, Remember my affliction and, ro and roaming, the wormwood and the gall that I've experienced. My soul still remembers and saints within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's, Jehovah's mercies, we're not dead or consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Praise God. Great is your faithfulness. Jehovah is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in him. Jehovah is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Jehovah. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. So when we're suffering, the prophet says, let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. The suffering is from God. So let him put his mouth in the dust. In other words, in that case, we should humble ourselves. There may yet be hope. Verse 31. And verse 30. Let him, who, let him then give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Yield, don't fight back, yield. And be full of reproach, accept the reproach, accept the affliction, the punishment, the situation. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, 
yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies, for he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God doesn't punish us willingly or because he wants to. He does what he does for our benefit. Not from his heart. Not, not because he hates us. But he's teaching us valuable lessons of character development and learning how to suffer so we can encourage others who are suffering. Because we've been there. We've done that. We've endured something similar. Great is God's faithfulness and His mercies are new every day, day by day. So when we wake up in the morning and get out of bed, we should say, I give thanks before you, eternal King, that you have returned my soul within me with compassion. Great is your faithfulness. We should begin the day starting by focusing on the positive. As Norman Vincent Peale wrote in his book years ago, the power of positive thinking. And I think I read that book twice. Maybe I'll read it again. It's got the scriptures in there that we can do all things through Christ. There's nothing impossible for God. But we've got to learn to focus on the positive and don't mess with the negative or Mr. In Between. We are alive, so we have hope. Every morning when we pray, we should recite a list of blessings. Focus on thanking the Almighty for what we have. We should aspire to make a hundred blessings, including before and after eating foods. Blessings on fulfilling commandments on seeing or hearing the awesomeness of God's creation, watching bunny rabbits in the backyard, or as we saw yesterday, Cappy saw, must have been 40 or 50 little quail on our back lawn, running around, All eating. eating whatever. seeds, or whatever was available. Just a whole flock of quail. Like 40 of them. 44 or 45. Well, she counted 44 or 45. When we see the quail, we see the birds and the eagles soaring in the sky. We see the awesomeness of the Almighty's creation. We see the lightning. We hear the thunder blast. Day by day. We feel the warmth of the sun. And we should say, fabulous. Thank you, God. Thank you for your blessings. How you view things becomes reality. If you think you can't do something, you can't. But if you think you can, 
you can. And God will provide to you greater strength, greater energy, the extra push to enable you to be more than a conqueror through him that loves us. So God's lesson for Vit Kanan is based upon the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 1 through 2 that we are to keep the commandments of God and not add to them or subtract from them. They're perfect. God is perfect. His law is perfect. So we shouldn't add to it thinking we can improve on God. And we shouldn't take away from His law thinking it's not necessary. We should keep all the law of God just as he presents it to us. Don't take away a word or a letter. And don't add a word or a letter. We need to keep God fresh in our mind every day and not but our blessings become old, or old hat. If things become old to us, we begin to take them for granted. We no longer appreciate them. Like Israel, thinking they got rich because of their own ability, their own strength. So they no longer have a sense of gratitude to the Almighty. Without a sense of gratitude, we will begin to neglect our obligations to God and many turn against Him and rebel or go AWOL and depart from the faith. So each day, look at all your life as you get up in the morning, look on your life. Look at your possessions. As if you just received them that very day. As if they're all brand new. Don't take them for granted. Look at them as a new daily gift from God. That's what every day is. A new gift. From God for you to use to glorify him and serve your neighbor serve your brother and your sister and to do a part your part in God's work what is your part how about prayer how about prayer how about witnessing how about giving a cheerful smile to everyone you meet. How about letting your light shine forth in good deeds, good works, and kindly spirit and attitudes? Measure for measure. Romans chapter 8 Paul says to each one of us with all the trials and tests that we go through in life he says, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called 
the ones called by God into his church according to his purposing. God chose us and he put us in his church. Maybe we have no idea why, but he did. You and me, brother and sister. Verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he knew us from the creation, when he devised us and planned us in advance. It's called predestination. He foreknew us and planned to create us at this time for this purpose, for this place, for this work. For whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed and changed into the very image of his son, Yeshua the Messiah that he, Yeshua, might be the firstborn among many brethren. And now we're in the same pathway, the same purpose, to be the brethren of Yeshua, to follow him, to be like him, conform to his spiritual image, Moreover, whom he predestined, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified and made righteous. And whom he made righteous, he also glorified or will glorify at his coming. What shall we say then to these thoughts, these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up on the cross for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things, all blessings, even to inherit the universe. And Paul says, all these trials we have, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, suffering, disease, nakedness, peril, the sword, sickness. What will separate us? Pain, suffering, as it's written, for your sake we're killed even, all day long. We're looked upon like sheep for the slaughter. But it's no matter. It's of no consequence. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Because in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are victorious. We are triumphant through him who loved us. Paul said, For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor Satan the devil, nor demons, nor powers, nor things on the earth today, nor things that are coming in the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, Yeshua our Lord. We are more than conquerors. As Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things Endure anything through Christ in me, who strengthens me. As Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, 
For to me, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So brethren, God has called us to the victorious life, the life of eternal triumph. He's called us out of the straits of narrow suffering and crushing slavery and despondency. He's called us into the glorious light of his family, his sons, as his children, to serve him to eternity. He's called us to eternal life. So now we begin the season of comfort ye. Comfort ye my people, God says. For your pain and suffering is over. You've paid your dues. It's time for to be comforted and to realize there is hope. Hope in God hope through Christ. And then God says, we say to God, great is thy faithfulness. So let's be encouraged. Let's have hope. Let's take comfort. And let's rejoice every day and give God thanks for every opportunity we have to serve Him, to study His Word, to read another scripture, to meditate on it, and to praise God. It's an opportunity to be devoutly cherished. Thank you for listening and being part of the Bible study today. May God bless you all and shower his blessings upon you and, and, you and shine his face upon you and give you peace and love. Amen.